Shall we start? Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to another exciting session of Dr. Agarwal's Grand Rounds. Dr. Agarwal's Grand Rounds is one of the prime educational initiatives undertaken by the hospital and the team at Clinical Board. We have a really intriguing topic for discussion today, an overview of pediatric glaucoma. Pediatric glaucoma, you all know, is quite a rare disease in its incidence. But nevertheless, we need to be very much cautious about it because it is a potentially vision-threatening disorder in the child. Pediatric glaucoma differs from adult glaucoma in more than one way. Pediatric glaucoma is all about raised intraocular pressure. We do not have entities like normal tension glaucoma in the pediatric population. But at the same time, the measurement of this IOP is tricky and often misleading. The pediatric eye responds to the raised intraocular pressure in a very different way. There is both enlargement of cornea as well as the glow, and this is termed as buscalmos. Pediatric glaucoma is all about an angle anomaly. In primary congenital glaucoma, we have an isolated trabeculodysgenesis, dysgenesis and secondary childhood glaucomas are secondary to outflow obstruction as a result of ocular or systemic diseases. Pediatric glaucoma, the optic nerve cupping, is very early in onset and rapid in progression. At the same time, this cupping is entirely reversible. If your pressure is brought well under control before there is a permanent optic nerve atrophy. Pediatric glaucoma management is all about surgical intervention, be it angle surgery, filtering surgery, or glaucoma drainage devices. And the role of medical management is very, very small. For best visual prognosis, it is not just IOP control that is important in pediatric glaucoma. We also need to look at factors such as iometropia and amblyopia management for best visual prognosis. So having given a small background about pediatric glaucoma, to talk us through this great topic, we have with us a renowned pediatric ophthalmologist all the way from Sydney, Australia, Dr. Parth Shah. Dr. Parth has been extensively being trained in hospitals such as the Prince of Wales Hospital and Children's Hospital Sydney at Randwick. He has a dual subspeciality fellowship to his credit he started off his career with the NHS in United Kingdom. He has worked in hospitals such as Birmingham, Gloucestershire, and Oxford. And later, he moved on to the US, where he was trained under the renowned pediatric ophthalmologist, Dr. Ken Niskell. Dr. Park is a well-rounded pediatric ophthalmologist because he's adept at dealing with pediatric glaucoma, pediatric cataract, pediatric gaunt corneal disorders, genetic disorders of the eye and strabismus. So it's going to be a pleasure listening to Dr. Path today. And apart from Path, to add to the discussion, we have two illustrious glaucoma specialists. One is my dear friend, Dr. Rengaraj Venkatesh, who's the chief medical officer of Aravind Eye Care System Pondicherry. And the other person is Dr. Sushmita Kaushik. She's the professor of ophthalmology and head of glaucoma services at PGI Chandigarh, and also the, the Secretary for Pediatric Glaucoma Society of India. So I would request Dr. Path to share his slides and begin his talk today. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and summary, uh, Dr. Manjula. That's, uh, that basically summarizes my whole talk in two minutes, which was fantastic. <laughs> uh, I'll just share my screen now. Hopefully you can all see it. Um, here we go. So um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak today. I'm very, I feel honored to be invited um, to this program. Uh, um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist here in Sydney. Um, in the next 25 minutes or so, I'll like to give an uh, overview of pediatric glaucoma. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, an overview of the talk, uh, I'll go through the case causes of pediatric glaucoma. Um, as you mentioned, there are several differences between pediatric and adult glaucoma that are important to bear in mind. 
uh, as well, and then I'll cover diagnosis and the basics of treatment, including surgery. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors who taught me about uh, pediatric glaucoma, uh, including Professor Mitchell from Pittsburgh in the USA, Mr. Abbott from Birmingham, UK, uh, and my colleague, Dr. Kimberly Tan here in Sydney, Australia. So pediatric glaucoma is a rare disease. Uh, it probably accounts for about 5% of childhood blindness around the world. Um, and primary congenital glaucoma or PCG, uh, depending on the population, is about one in 18,500 or one in 20,000 births. Um, congenital and pediatric glaucoma uh, is managed slightly differently depending on where you are around the world. Uh, often it's managed by pediatric ophthalmologists rather than glaucoma specialists. Uh, and that's certainly the case uh, where I work here in Sydney, Australia. Uh, but in other centers around the world, it may be managed by comprehensive as well as glaucoma, uh, adult glaucoma specialists. Um, so what are the differences in pediatric versus adult glaucoma? Uh, the first thing is that there are different causes, uh, and we often think about uh, congenital structural anomalies and secondary causes, which we don't always think about in primary open angle glaucoma that we see in adults. Um, Pediatric glaucoma is all about the pressure. There's no such entity as what we call normal tension glaucoma in adults, uh, but measuring the pressure accurately can be very tricky and sometimes misleading. The examination parameters in pediatric glaucoma are also quite different to adults. Uh, so we know that the sclera is quite elastic, uh, especially up until about four years of age. And because of this higher intraocular pressure actually leads to globe enlargement rather than as a protective mechanism uh, to reduce damage to the optic nerve. Uh, when the cornea gets stretched, uh, we see ruptures in Decimase membrane, uh, and that leads to a characteristic Harb's tree, which we also do not see in adults with high pressure. And finally, uh, surgery is often performed in the angle rather than performing uh, trabeculectomies and tube surgeries, especially in primary congenital forms. Uh, which have an abnormally formed angle. In adults, we often rely on OCT and visual fields to guide us in, uh, in the assessment and progression of glaucoma. And we don't have that in children, firstly, because we can't really perform visual fields reliably uh, in young children, uh, and it's difficult to get an OCT scan of the nerve. So usually the structure function correlation of glaucoma isn't possible in children. The classification system um, for pediatric glaucoma usually is split up into primary congenital glaucoma uh, and secondary glaucoma. And secondary glaucoma, the most common cause would be following cataract surgery in infancy. Uh, there are non-acquired ocular, anom ocular anomalies, uh, which is a significant proportion of what I see in my practice, such as axenfeld rieger syndrome, aniridia, and other anterior segment developmental anomalies. They can be non-acquired systemic disorders, such as neurofibromatosis, as well as acquired conditions, such as steroid-induced juvedic trauma and tumor. Finally, there's also a different entity called juvenile open-angle glaucoma, which presents uh, in later childhood or early adulthood. Uh, this uh, classification system uh, is from the World Glaucoma Association uh, Childhood Glaucoma Consensus Statement, and I've left the reference there for you. So primary congenital glaucoma, uh, the angle has a very specific look um, due to uh, trabecular dysgenesis, and uh, it does not always present at birth. So the, the label of primary congenital glaucoma can be a bit misleading. Uh, it can present in the first or second year of life. There are many genes that are implicated. Uh, the most uh, important one being CYP1B1, which is inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. This condition tends to respond well to angle surgery uh, and opening up the angle. Uh, here's a child who's had um, uh, Harbs, this uh, picture. I just wanted to show uh, the Harbs tree going across the cornea, both in the external photograph uh, as well as in retroillumination. And this is a characteristic feature of congenital glaucoma. This is another child with bilateral congenital glaucoma. You can see that the left cornea is relatively clear. The right one is hazy, and on retroillumination, you can see multiple, multiple Harbs tree 
uh, uh, in multiple directions of the cornea. This is that same child's uh, fundus uh, imaging. Uh, the right eye, because of the corneal haze, is not clear, but the disc is extremely cupped. Uh, the left eye has a relatively uh, much more healthier disc after treatment. In terms of glaucoma after pediatric cataract surgery, this can happen in both uh, in children who are left aphakic or have intraocular lenses inserted. Uh, the younger the age at the time of cataract surgery, as well as uh, structural anomaly with a small anterior segment and cornea increase the risk of developing uh, postoperative glaucoma. It can happen uh, soon after or uh, many years after pediatric cataract surgery. There's various mechanisms which are postulated. Uh, it, is, it can be quite difficult to manage and in general surgical treatment is required. I mentioned the ocular anomalies such as Axenfeld Riga aniridia and uh, anterior segment developmental anomalies, uh, which is previously termed Peters anomaly. In terms of systemic diseases, um, it's always important to look out for uh, a child with potential glaucoma, whether they may have a systemic condition, and uh, this may require referral to a pediatrician to screen for uh, other anomalies, including intracranial problems that the child may have such as this child who has a port wine stain extending into the um, orbit and onto the eye and causing glaucoma. And here's an example of a more diffuse uh, port wine stain associated with Sturge Weber syndrome and also causing unilateral glaucoma. Some other systemic diseases are listed on this slide. Low syndrome is one of the few uh, congenital syndromes which is X-linked and causes both congenital glaucoma and cataract. So I added this slide in, um, depending on where you are around the world, uh, as to when should you refer a child with suspected glaucoma? And the answer is really as early as possible. Um, earlier intervention, usually through surgery, leads to better visual outcomes. And if possible, uh, prior to referral, if you have the opportunity to perform an exam under anesthesia or sedation to obtain baseline parameters, that would also be quite helpful. So just going through the clinical approach to pediatric glaucoma, the symptoms that children present with um, can be uh, overlooked because they are quite commonly associated with other more common uh, pediatric eye pathologies. So photophobia, watering and blepharospasm may be related to ocular surface disease. It may be related to uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Um, but they are also the symptoms of congenital glaucoma, so it's important to bear these in mind. Uh, visual function may be normal at the beginning, uh, but with corneal haze, uh, it rapidly, rapidly deteriorates. Uh, it's important to ask about family history of ocular anomalies and uh, childhood glaucoma. Uh, examination, as with uh, examination of any child presenting into the clinic, we always assess their visual function in an age-appropriate manner. Uh, we look for an enlarged or signs of an enlarged eye, including uh, corneal enlargement. The corneal clarity uh, is assessed. The presence of Harb's tree is pathognomonic of uh, glaucoma in the childhood uh, age group. Now, elevated intraocular pressure, I've put a little star next to it because it's really um, measuring the intraocular pressure can be very challenging in, in infants and children. Uh, and depending on the methods used, it can be quite inaccurate and unreliable. Optic nerve cupping, um, which as discussed, can be reversible, but also rapidly progressive. One sign uh, on the examination that can be helpful as a clue towards glaucoma is progressive myopia. I mean, we're seeing a lot of myopia uh, around the world uh, and much more so than we did uh, one or two decades ago but progressive and pathological myopia in a young infant uh, should always raise alarm bells for possible glaucoma. And in cases where unilateral disease is, um, is possible, uh, looking for asymmetry between the two eyes can be one of the most helpful clues. So what are some tips to measuring intraocular pressure in children? Uh, it's important that the child is relaxed. If they're crying, or um, in blepharospasm and squeezing their eyelids that can rapidly increase the intraocular pressure uh, and you won't get an accurate um, reading. 
Uh, we're fortunate here where I work in my centres to have a rebound tonometry in the form of an eye care, um, which is quite easy to obtain uh, intraocular pressure in the child. It's important to get central uh, measurements through the central cornea in an area of relative corneal clarity, if possible, to let it be more accurate. Uh, Applanation tonometry can be quite difficult uh, in, in children unless they're um, sedated. Uh, digital tonometry, which is, I mean, using our two fingers to measure the pressure on the eye, can often be one of the most uh, reliable methods in structurally abnormal eyes and in children. Uh, and I'd encourage everyone and I encourage my residents to really um, get an idea of what's normal and what's raised um, by examining as many children as possible and feeling their eye pressure. In terms of the examination in the clinic, uh, this can be performed awake uh, or asleep. Uh, one of the most helpful things that can aid us in examining children uh, especially to get multiple parameters is after the child has been breastfed or bottle fed um, when the child uh, when you might have a couple of minutes to examine as much as needed for the child including sometimes getting an axial length even in the clinic if this isn't possible then an exam under anesthesia may be organized uh, and it may need to be combined with a glaucoma procedure at the same time so in terms of the exam under anesthesia, I have a specific protocol that I use uh, so that I get all the information in as quick a uh, time as possible. Uh, Preoperatively, if the patient is um, not having any uh, surgery planned, then cycloventilate can be instilled. Uh, if surgery may be planned, then I usually instill phenylephrine only, uh, and then pilocarpine can be instilled uh, prior to doing angle surgery. The corneal diameter is measured, the anterior segment is checked for corneal clarity, the anterior chamber status of the iris and the lens, uh, and this is done with a direct ophthalmoscope and if you have one, a portable slit lamp as well. Uh, the optic disc is checked uh, and the degree of cupping noted, cycloplegic refraction for um, myopia. Uh, gonioscopy, it's, I think it's really helpful to perform gonioscopy on many as many children as possible, even if they're not there for a glaucoma assessment just to understand what's normal and what's not normal. Uh, axial length, contact axial length measurements with an A scan, uh, and if there is uh, no view to the fundus, then a B scan uh, is helpful. It's important to remember that intraocular pressure under anesthesia is not reliable unless it's done quite early at induction. Uh, succinylcholine, ketamine uh, can increase intraocular pressure. Uh, uh, as can hypercapnia, uh, whereas most other anesthesia agents reduce, intra reduce intraocular pressure, especially inhalational gases. So this is a setup that I have for, um, this is a picture from uh, my time with Professor Nishal in the US, but this is a setup that we have for doing an EUA. Uh, and we um, have these special uh, calipers to measure uh, horizontal corneal diameter, and these are not affected by um, autoclaving. And this is the uh, sheet that we use to record all the information. So corneal diameter, axial length, entry chamber depth, cornea uh, appearance, uh, as well as the refraction, uh, keratometry, and any other measurements that we've taken. One thing that I did learn during my time in the States was uh, the use of a linear ultrasound for a B scan. Uh, these are readily available, uh, usually by in the anesthetic bay. Uh, the, our anesthetic colleagues usually use these to look for veins um, in difficult cannulations. Uh, and this can be used as an easy way to do a B scan if you don't have a dedicated B scan available. So it's also important to note what normal parameters are. So axial length um, uh, at birth uh, and normal ranges over time. Uh, so this is a graph. Uh, that goes through uh, the normal range and the median. Uh, horizontal corneal diameter also increases with age. Uh, and uh, a child who's uh, got corneal diameters of more than 11 millimeters at birth uh, or more than 12 millimeters at the first year of life uh, almost certainly has glaucoma. So it's important to have normal uh, parameters in mind so that you know what's abnormal. Some differential diagnosis for a cloudy cornea. 
such as corneal dystrophy, which is even rarer than pediatric glaucoma, as well as a condition called X-linked megalocornea, where the cornea can be larger than 12 or 13 millimeters, but there are no Harbs 3 present. So now to run through some of the management options for pediatric glaucoma. Uh, as with adult glaucoma, we can do medications, laser or surgery. In terms of the medications, we have eye drops. It's important uh, in children to reduce systemic absorption through nasolacral exclusion, uh, occlusion, sorry, and removing excess drops. Uh, the main uh, drops that we prefer are beta blockers uh, in a low, low concentration, such as 0.25% timolol. Uh, in an older child, it may, it may uh, be associated with a nocturnal cough. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor drops uh, can be associated with growth suppression as well as metabolic acidosis. And prostaglandin analogs uh, can also be used, but they do have a pro-inflammatory tendency and I avoid them post-operatively if possible. Uh, it's always important to remember and teach our residents that alpha agonist drops are contraindicated in infants and young children as they cause central nervous system suppression. Um, in children who have severely high pressure, uh, oral acetazolamide can be used as a temporizing measure until you can get them to surgery. But medications are not a good long-term option and certainly are not an option, uh, a definitive treatment option for pediatric glaucoma. So laser, uh, the types of laser that we can use for uh, treating pediatric glaucoma can be traditional uh, cyclodiode laser, which is destructive uh, and quite inflammatory. And this is reserved usually for non-seeing eyes or in children uh, who require definitive surgery, such as a glaucoma drainage device, um, a tube shunt. Uh, and if, po if possible, we like to delay that until the child is older and it can be a great temporizing measure. Often in children, uh, diode laser needs to be repeated on multiple occasions for the full effect. Uh, I'll show you a slide coming up about uh, how that can be applied. Micropulse laser is a relatively newer modality, uh, which uses a special, uh, some of the lasers can do both cyclodiode and micropulse, but it delivers the energy in a different way, and it's thought to increase uveoscleral outflow. Uh, so the transcleral cyclodiode can be guided by retroillumination to find the location uh, of the ciliary body, but in complex anterior segment anomalies, the limbus uh, can be difficult to tell uh, and retroillumination may not be helpful. And in these settings, um, if we have ultra ultrasound biomicroscopy, uh, that can be used to help guide the location of the di diode laser. And uh, Professor Nishul had uh, published that technique in the past, and I've left the reference there. So in terms of surgery, uh, surgery in pediatric glaucoma is very challenging, um, especially compared to adults. Uh, there's a higher failure and complication rate, um, just owing to the abnormal structure that we encounter. The options that we have up our sleeve are angle surgery, uh, which often needs to be repeated more than once, uh, trabeculectomy with an antimetabolite such as mitomycin, insertion of a glaucoma drainage device, um, and there are several different tube shunt options available. Uh, and finally, um, enucleation uh, as a last resort uh, in children who um, have either unsightly eyes or a very painful photophobic eye. Uh, these children require uh, multiple procedures and lifelong follow-up. So the first example is of a goniotomy, um, and these are just diagrammatic representations of what is done. Uh, a needle or blade um, is used to uh, incise uh, what is thought to be Barkham's membrane, which is covering the uh, trabecular meshwork, and uh, usually through one incision, about up to 120 degrees of treatment may be possible. Uh, it's useful in cases where uh, there's a relatively clear cornea, as with um, all pediatric glaucoma, we don't expect that the cornea is gonna be completely clear. Um, the cornea, corneal clarity can be improved uh, perioperatively through acetazolamide or mannitol, uh, as well as, um, uh, reducing the pressure as much as possible preoperatively. Uh, a direct craniotomy lens is applied. 
the microscope, so one of the main issues with the goniotomy is getting the setup correct and rotating the microscope and the head of the child. Uh, viscoelastic can be injected, uh, certainly makes a surgery um, safer, but it does need to be removed as much as possible at the end. Either a 25 gauge needle or an MVR blade may be used. Um, and the iris root uh, falls away and this can be visualized intraoperatively. An assistant uh, to rotate the eye can allow for more treatment area. It's important that the assistant uh, holds the eye um, st in a stable fashion so that the AC doesn't collapse. Um, hopefully this video will show you an example of a goniotomy. Um, so this is a, a lens um, entering with a 25 gauge needle and crossing uh, the eye and hopefully you can see that um, the sizing tissue you can see that the iris root is falling away uh, a little bit of bleeding is expected and helps us to know that we're in the right area the assistant is holding the eye stable with two tooth forceps um, in this particular procedure, it's important to be mindful of the lens um, and uh, that the eye can collapse quite easily. And so having the needle on a viscoelastic can be helpful to inject viscoelastic to stabilize the chamber. The other thing to mention here is that um, there are new, newer disposable uh, gonioscopy lenses available, especially with the advent of a micro uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery in adults. Uh, and some of those lenses can be um, purchased. Uh, in cases such as in this child where um, there is no, the cornea is not clear, there's also a structural anomaly in the eye, uh, it's not possible to do uh, goniotomy. And uh, an alternative would be an external procedure such as a trabeculotomy, uh, and it can be done in eyes with a hazy cornea. A scleral flap is created. Um, and where white meets blue, Schlem waits for you. Um, I've got a video coming up. Viscoelastic, a Harms trabecular term, or a 360 suture, uh, such as a proline or nylon suture is an alternative, although I don't use that particular technique, I use the trabecular term. So again, this is a diagrammatic representation. Um, we're trying to recreate the, what the same thing is in the goniotomy, but um, from outside the eye. Um, this is that same child that I showed you, um, very abnormal eye, a conch protome is created, um, then a partial thickness scleral flap. Uh, these cases can be extremely challenging to find uh, where exactly the Schlem's canal is. And often sclera is extremely thin. Um, so it can be, it's not like a traditional trabeculectomy in an adult, unfortunately. So looking for Schlem's canal here um, and very carefully incising uh, the sclera, looking for a bulge or a change in the color. This is a quite an abnormal eye, so it's not a great example of what I said earlier about where white meets blue. Um, and then you'll see the trabecular tone shortly. And this is, there's uh, two different ones. One goes to the left, one goes to the right. Um, and it incises into the AC and then it's removed. And again, we do it in the other direction. You can see some of the blood exiting slams. And you can feel the resistance give way. The flap is closed and the conge is closed. Um, and typically the pressure is almost, um, you know, in the single digits by the end of the case, because uh, the AC will have collapsed slightly. And you can see the red reflex has returned in this eye. So finally, um, talking about the child as a whole, um, remembering that pediatric glaucoma is associated with amblyopia, 
uh, and this may be an isometropic, so it's more uh, glaucoma. The, the eye with the worst glaucoma will be more myopic. Uh, there is also sensory deprivation, uh, which can be either from the corneal opacity um, or associated cataract. And the corneal opacity can be either edema, Harb's tree, uh, especially Harb's tree going across the visual axis, uh, and later um, stromal scarring can occur. It's important to correct refractive error, uh, and uh, advanced glaucoma can result in severe optic neuropathy, uh, which in the late stages will not be reversible. So managing the child, we need to manage the glaucoma as much as possible uh, and manage it uh, more aggressively than we would in adults. Um, Prognosis is related to the severity and the delay of presentation, as well as the underlying condition that the child may have. Maximizing the vision as much as possible by treating amblyopia and optimizing refraction regularly, uh, if possible, and um, to help guide further testing and evaluation from a systemic perspective, uh, genetic evaluation can be helpful. I'm very fortunate to work in an institution where we have a strong genetics department uh, and patients can have a uh, more of an informed decision making, especially with regards to their own future. These children have many, many visits to the clinic and the operating room. Uh, we develop a lifelong relationship with these children and their parents. Uh, one thing that can be helpful, which um, my mentor in the UK, Joe Abbott, has developed with his colleagues is a childhood glaucoma passport, which has a lot of information about glaucoma. Uh, I can have all the information about the child's uh, visits to hospital and their uh, parameters. And um, it also helps a child navigate through glaucoma um, uh, in their later years uh, and when they go to school. Always consider whether the child, uh, always consider the child's fellow eye uh, and whether they're an only eye child. I think social circumstances are critical, um, depending on where, where in the world you work. Uh, in Australia, we also have vast distances. Uh, we do have um, a great health system, but we have many children who live in remote and rural parts of Australia, and they can't easily access healthcare. Um, and it's important to involve older children in the decision-making as much as possible. So in summary, uh, pediatric glaucoma is a condition that's quite different to adult glaucoma. There's different causes, pathophysiology and treatment. It's important to look at the entire picture. We rely less on intraocular pressure alone. Uh, and there are several other parameters like the axial length, the corneal diameter, uh, and the patient's symptoms that guide us. Uh, try to look for a secondary cause as this may have uh, implications for the general health of the child. And remember that the child as a whole includes managing the glaucoma, but also their refraction and vision, amblyopia, uh, and managing a long-term relationship with the child and the parents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Park. That was such an interesting talk of yours. Um, I you. invite Dr. Sushmita and Dr. Rangaraj to unmute their uh, mics so that we can get into the discussion. So I will start off with uh, evaluation under anesthesia because that's such an integral part of a pediatric glaucoma evaluation. So I'll start with Dr. Venkatesh. Uh, which modality of IOP measurement would you prefer? Is it the Perkins applination, or uh, would you like to use the toner pen, or is it the rebound eye care uh, tonometer, which Dr. Parth mentioned? Which one of these uh, uh, three modalities you would prefer, and which would be the closest to your uh, standard Goldman applination tonometer? And the other part of the question that I would like is, uh, why isn't pachymetry and the corneal thickness correction factor not such an important parameter in the pediatric population as compared to adults? So yeah. both parts of the question. Yeah. For the first question, Dr. Manjula, I think uh, uh, I personally prefer, and now we routinely do the eye care tonometry for a simple reason. It's very simple. And okay. also you get a very objective reading, you know, which is quite reliable. See, sometimes when you do a Perkins, which is normally we used to do, you know, the the Myers are not very clear, you know, and you have you have trained somebody. You are you are you are kind of sterile. Uh, somebody else is doing it. You don't know how reliable it is. Mm -hmm. And somewhere eye care I found was a little more reliable than even doing the Perkins. So between Perkins and eye care, I would do both if needed, but eye care I would prefer. 
And for your second question, definitely, you know, because of the pannier thickness associated, the scarring, the half spray, uh, because most of the Indian eyes, if you see, they usually have a hazy cornea. So I'm sure uh, there's no point in uh, relying anything on corneal thickness and maybe correcting for IOP because normally they have very uh, thicker corneas because of these problems. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Sushmita, uh, regarding corneal diameter, Dr. Path uh, showed uh, some fancy looking, you know, uh, calipers for measuring the diameter, but we usually in India, we use uh, either the calipers or the graduated ruler. I think, which one would you prefer to use? And is it limbus to limbus? How do you go about measuring the corneal diameter? Can you give some offer, some tips regarding measurement of corneal diameter? Because the horizontal corneal diameter is definitely one of the parameters we keep uh, to look for progression of glaucoma in a child. Yeah, so we use, we don't uh, have the calipers that Dr. Parth showed, but we use the usual calipers, which we have in the OR. And uh, it's, I mean, we make a best guess of the limbus wherever the white is, uh, you, know, you know, going on to the cornea, that is where, I mean, the, the furthest part of clear cornea, which is the easiest to, because it's very difficult to know where exactly the surgical limbus starts and where the anatomical ends. So wherever is the is the furthest clear cornea is is what we take, but lately I must uh, admit that we've started uh, relying on the axial length a lot more. So oh. we do have the axial length graph of San Paolo that Dr. Path showed, and the at the back of every file, mm -hmm. and uh, every visit the axial length is plotted, and uh, especially I mean this COVID era has taught us a lot, and one amongst that is how to minimize the visits of the patients and the visits of children and of course to minimize EUA. So one thing that has worked is of course the eye care in the clinic if the child allows and a clear cornea depending on what it was at baseline mm -hmm. and the axial length and usually we've seen that the axial length uh, you know if it's rising mm -hmm. and then it actually does straighten out and mimics the slope of the normal growth because mm -hmm. uh, it's important to understand that a mere axial length makes no sense. Okay. There is no point in telling me that the axial length in a four month old child is 21 millimeters. So what does that mean? So it's important for me to know that, all right, maybe it is 21 millimeters, which is high for maybe a three month old child. But once I've done surgery, it has, it is mimicking the slope and that has made a huge difference to our follow-ups. So I think more than corneal diameter, because for that you need at least a child under sedation or a quiet child, the axial length is far easier. And our optoms with the cataract surgeons are so adept at doing it, they just catch hold of the child as long as it's not crying or something and it just takes a minute and it's done. Somebody in the audience wants to know what is the normal corneal diameter in a preterm? Of course, a normal term corneal diameter is around 10.5. Somebody has uh, you know, put up this question. Would you like to take it up, Dr. Sushmita, or let us leave it to him to Google search? <laughs> no, no. I don't think, I don't think there is a, a normative database for preterm, pre frankly, because, because it's now that these babies have started surviving. And uh, we've started seeing preterms with dysgenesis as well. Of course, mm -hmm. not, to, not to take away from the fact that ROP-associated glaucoma is something to keep in mind. You can have raised pressures following laser indirect. You can have it following LSV. So it's a, it's a conundrum of what to do. I've had babies who have had an LIO in one eye and an LSV in the other. And mm -hmm. the LSV eye is normal and the LIO eye has become you know, mm -hmm. glaucomatous. And actually, a genetics has has figured out a tech mutation. So all sorts of things, the conundrum is so much. So answering the question, the preterm corneal diameter, I'm not aware of a normative uh, value for that. But a corneal diameter would be very low on my priority for diagnosing glaucoma in a preterm. I would look for other things like the corneal haze and the axial length and things like that. And of course, the history of ROP treatment. Very, very important. Uh, you want to add something? No, no, that's a good study for people who do ROP screening routinely. Definitely. Uh, that, uh, uh, if there is no normative, I'm sure there is a very good publication out of it. Definitely. 
uh, shall I move on to the next question? Dr. Path, of course, you showed a nice, beautiful picture of the gonioscopic appearance of a uh, abnormal angle. But yeah. can you exactly how uh, tell us how do you differentiate for novices? How do you differentiate? Because you are used to seeing these abnormal angles from normal angles uh, so many times. But how do you exactly differentiate an abnormal uh, gonioscopic angle from a normal angle in a pediatric population? And what kind of lenses do you use? Do you use the KP or do you use the Swan Jacob or you use the Barkin lens? What is your lens? for looking at the angle, the preference of choice? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I, I think um, in terms of the lens that I prefer, um, there's a disposable lens, especially in this COVID era, um, there's a disposable lens that's available with, um, a, a lot of our adult colleagues are using these uh, with inserting eye stents or other uh, glaucoma stents into the angles of adults. And so, um, there's been a lot of uh, the proprietary lenses manufactured by these uh, manufacturers of the stents, um, and they're actually disposable and they give a really good magnified view of the angle. Uh, so I used to use the Hoskins lens or the Swan Jacob, either one of those, but um, I think I've now preferred using the more disposable ones, one of them which is um, sold along with the eye stent. Um, so we can buy that as a disposable um, gonioscopic lens and it's um, a very light uh, and it comes on a handle. Uh, I don't have a picture of it here to show you, but um, that's the lens that I'm preferring at the moment and it just reduces some of the issues with regard to uh, operating and sterility. Um, in terms of the gonioscopic um, uh, views in an adult, uh, sorry, in a normal angle uh, in a child, um, even the, the, the reason why I recommend my residents to look at the angle, even in normal infants for who are putting to sleep for other things such as uh, strabismus surgeries, the infant angles don't look the same as adults. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is the scleral spur um, forms later on in childhood. Um, and so what we look for is the ciliary body band and the pigmented trabecular meshwork. Uh, and uh, essentially, if there's an absent ciliary body band, then um, it points to possible trabecular dysgenesis. Um, I can put that um, picture up again, just for a bit longer, uh, just for the audience, um, if you like. Um, and that picture was actually taken from um, this book on childhood glaucoma. So this is a really good resource. Um, and that's got a lot of pictures in it. So for people who are looking at um, angles, but um, that's uh, sort of like a classic um, irritate, like a trabecular dysgenesis primary congenital glaucoma angle where we can't actually see the ciliary body band um, and we can just see the iris, iris um, and sort of- Prominent iris. Yeah, with, the, with the eye of faith, maybe, um like some sort of membrane that covers the angle but um when we think about that when we're uh, can you see it oh i'm not sure if you saw it um. uh Venkatesh, the next question is about the cup disc ratio now uh, what are the flag of uh, signals or the red flags for uh, you know suspecting an enlarged uh, or a glaucomatous disc in a child so what would you take as the cup disc ratio when you suspect that this child is definitely, you know, having uh, some issue of glaucoma? So anything you like to uh, give your inputs on? on this? Not, uh, nicely covered that. I think it's more uh, the diagnosis of primary congenital or a glaucoma in any secondary anomalies. Now you go for a straightforward diagnosis. Uh, under EUA with several other factors from corneal diameter to I, I agree, the other factors are there, but then, you know, certain, like, like even how we say, yeah, even if you're optical, corneal diameter, we have some parameters in the corneal diameter, isn't it? When it's more than 13 millimeters at any age is definitely abnormal and more than 11 in a one-year-old child is definitely abnormal. So similarly, as far as cup disc ratio, do you still have some guidelines to provide? Nothing, nothing like that to my... Nothing like that. I leave it to Madam. To it's an overall assessment that uh, you would rather say, you put it as. Okay, I doctor. think I think generally, Dr. Banjula, it's uh, uh, in adults is taken as more than 0. 0.7. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. But for uh, children less than two years, it's more than 0.4. And remember, a neonate has no cup at all, usually. Mm-hmm. So anything more than 0.4 would make me very, very suspicious in a small child. In a small and baby. for asymmetry. And look for asymmetry. I yes. think that's the other. But yeah, like, like Dr. Venkatesh said, it's such a conundrum of things mm-hmm. that you have to really put pieces Everything of the puzzle together. Puzzle mm-hmm. together. Can I make a small comment on the gonioscopy, which we yeah, have learned please. over the years? Please. So, uh, Sam Paulesi, actually, the person who is, he's done phenomenal work in the 60s and 70s, so he's actually looked back at his gonioscopies, uh, uh, goniotomies, and looked at the drawings of gonioscopies of children who did not do well. Mm-hmm. And he actually has mentioned a type 1 and type 2 angle. And the kind that Dr. Path showed would be a type 2 angle where, where a lot of the iris process is covering a lot of trabecular meshwork. And he found out that those are the angles which probably won't do well with the goniotomy. So it's well within your mind to know or prognosticate that you might have to come back for a second. Whereas a type 1 angle, the trabecular meshwork is visible. And if you can see the entire trabecular meshwork, you can prognosticate that, look, I think you have a garden variety of infantile glaucoma, one goniotomy will suffice. So that's something which we found very useful when we are doing the goniotomy in these children. As well. I will address the next question also to you, Dr. Sushmita. Yeah. Uh, there are not a lot of investigations that we can do on a child because there isn't normative data like, you know, you can't do an OCT, RNFL, you can't do uh, fields and things like that. So what relevant, of course, you mentioned the axial length. Apart from that, would you say any other relevant investigations like a UBM or something like that in a child which we need to perform? For us, uh, UBM in the OR has been a game changer. I have learned so much clinically ever since we managed to get a dedicated UBM in the OR for every cornea which does not allow me to examine the anterior chamber, I would do a UBM. And it's amazing the amount of information you get and how you can manage to even even plan the surgeries that you need to do. So if somebody asked me the one investigation that you would require in a hazy cornea in a baby, it would be the UBM for me. The other thing I would just extend, even though we don't have normative data, but you have a, a very asymmetric presentation in an older child. I think definitely we can still do investigations like the fields and the OCT, RNS, isn't it? The minute, the minute the child can do a field, I will put him on a machine. And my youngest has gone down to about four or five years if they are because you 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 know you you uh, they know video games these days. So if you sort of coax them into doing that, and I think when they are small babies, they've heard your voice before they've even heard anybody else's. So they know this auntie means business. So I might as well you know do what she says. So. We put them on the visual field machine as early as possible. And before that, we put them on the OCT and the discs as well. So yes, certainly. I'm waiting for PGI to give me the money to buy a handheld OCT and a fundus picture because then I'll have more investigations for them. But right now, I don't. I wish so, I uh, just to add to what Madam yes, said, you know, after we started working with the virtual reality visual field analysis, yeah. this is an added okay. advantage now. I have some of my kids who are 10 years, 12 years now it's easier for them to do it? Uh, yeah, they have been doing comfortably. Now, once they understood what's happening, they were been So we were able to really assess their visual fields. Then even a Humphrey, you know, see that because they are so used to virtual reality and all those kind mm. of games. So That's it is, a nice point. I think this is for the future, right? So you also develop one, the Elisa, which is there in the market, the IVA from uh, Sandals team and few others across the globe. I think this is another role for it. Excellent, excellent point uh, made there, Venkatesh. Uh, Dr. Pat, uh, uh, we'll go on to primary, each of the glaucoma entities. So I'll start with uh, primary congenital glaucoma. Since you're into genetics, now we uh, we know that PCG is uh, both sporadic and autosomal recessive in inheritance. So it's prudent actually to examine uh, family members, be it siblings or offsprings of patients with primary congenital glaucoma. But uh, if there is no family history of consanguinity, let's say you ca- get a case of PCG where there is no history of uh, uh, consanguinity among the parents, would it still be prudent to examine the members of uh, this family? Would you still do? Or how much is the risk of PCG in such uh, children? 
That's a very interesting question. I tend to examine the parents. Um, so any child who has glaucoma, I do examine the parents in detail regardless, um, because some, some cases that were thought to be PCG ended up being a very mild form of an Axenfeld Rieger anomaly, which can be dominant um, in nature. So I always examine the parents. Um, in here, like it, at the Institute where I work in Sydney, at Sydney Children's Hospital, we have a big genetics unit uh, and it's very easy for us to get genetic testing and genetic counselling performed. Uh, so for these rare, I mean, because it's a rare disease, um, the genetics department is very happy to sort of help us and to do genetic testing, uh, especially as it may um, change uh, both the parents' um, reproductive decision making as well as for the child in the future. So any any child who has glaucoma, I do tend to refer so you them don't to. Look, you don't bottle it down to a child with a parental history or a family history of uh, consanguinity. So any no. child with PCG would still go ahead and uh, do the genetic. I do, yeah. They, they tend to run a, a panel. Um, they have sort of, uh, depending on uh, where you work, uh, they have a panel of genes that they run for a primary conge like a, a pediatric glaucoma panel. Um, and... Uh, yeah, in the population that I see, um, I don't see as many patients who have autosomal recessive conditions generally. Um, we have less consanguinity here. And so, um, yeah, I tend to look at the history and the clinical examination, but still send almost everyone for molecular testing. That's excellent. Dr. Sushmita, this question that I would ask is, what would be your first choice of surgery? Uh, if it's an angle surgery, is it goniotomy? What is your first choice of surgery in a child with PCG? So if I can see the angle, a goniotomy. Okay. Uh, maybe even a GAT, if I can manage it. I use, we don't have the illuminated microcatheter available in India, mm -hmm. but uh, even uh, proline suture works well. But then um, if I find resistance in the proline, I'm very hesitant to carry on with it. So even if it's a hemi-GAT on one side, it's easy to complete the goniotomy on the other. At least you get to 70, if not an entire 360. So I'll try to treat as much of the angle. If I cannot cannulate it inside or within, uh, I'll have my smart SR move the eye as much as possible and rotate it so that I get to to do as much goniotomy as possible. So you all think this, if it's a clear angle, you would do a goniotomy, otherwise you'll go in for a triple yeah. Well, it will never be clear, like Dr. Park said. It okay. will never be clear. Okay. Uh, I think the correct way to say it is if you can see the angle. So even if, if you you're seeing him uh, see it hazily, you can. And the one tip I picked up from, I think, uh, uh, Nicola Friedman is, that you can give Diamox in very small babies. I used to be so scared. Mm -hmm. And we always went along with this, that we have cloudy cornea, so we can't do goniotomies. And she saw, sort of, and Dr. Ken Nischel also pushed me into give it. You have your patient admitted, it's not going to. So the, the dose is about 20 to 25 milligram per kg in two divided doses a day in children more than six months of age. And that again has has raised my incidence of goniotomies more than it was. So it clears beautifully in a day or two yeah. and mm -hmm. touch wood, nothing has happened. But yes, we have half, I would say, where we can't. And there Dr. Mandel has taught us all that combined trabeculectomy and trabeculotomy works the best. So if I can see the angle, it's goniotomy. If I can't see the angle, I wouldn't do only a trabeculotomy. If I've opened up, the conjunctiva and I've made a scleral flap, I will combine it with a trabeculectomy and finish it off in one sitting. So that's Excellent. our usual preferred approach. Venkatesh, I would like to ask you about the ASDA, anterior segment developmental anomalies. I think these children present with glaucoma a little later than uh, you know, PCG children. So what would uh, uh, your procedure of choice is? Will it be a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C or what is the surgical thing that you would uh, implement in these children? So usually, if they are older children, and again, let's go into anterior segment de developmental anomalies yeah. like uh, Rieger's yes, anomaly yes. or Peter's anomaly or high risk hypoplasia, any of these conditions. See, there was something which applies for congenital primary congenital glaucoma, we can always do, uh, especially okay. the trabeculotomy combination with the trabeculectomy. Okay. If I'm doing a successful trabeculotomy, I'm happy with it, I stop with that. Otherwise, I just combine a trabeculectomy also, looking at the other uh, 
conditions and how the cupping is and how the pressure is. So you combine both, it really works in some of these eyes. Dr. Pat, what about anaeridia? Children with anaeridia, what is your take? What would be your... Uh, they are very difficult because you have the whole spectrum of problems in anaeridia, right yeah. from liberal stem cell uh, deficiency to foveal hypoplasia and angle abnormalities. So, mm -hmm. and of course, you don't have uh, anything protecting the lens too. So, yeah. you know, what is your take yeah. on these children? If they have yeah, so, so I, I would follow what um, Ken Nishal taught me, which is um, trying to do a careful goniotomy and sometimes even a prophylactic goniotomy uh, to prevent glaucoma, um, especially when the cornea is clear. Um, and then sometimes uh, temporizing, uh, they can develop um, high pressure and glaucoma even earlier and sometimes temporizing laser and the tube um, tube shunt later on uh, but as you say there's they have problems with the cornea as well as uh, lens touch um, in the future so they can be very challenging uh, to treat but i would i would probably follow the same um, algorithm in general uh, including goniotomy despite not having any uh, iris protecting the lens and so these are some of the most challenging uh, surgery <laughs> that we perform so, Dr. Parth, what would be your indication for a prophylactic goniotomy? I haven't had the heart to do it I, as yet, but when do you do it, if at all? Yeah, look, I, I haven't had the opportunity or the need to do one in my practice so far. Um, but um, when I was working with Ken Nishal, he um, showed me a couple of cases where um, the child um, on gonioscopy um, was developing progressive narrowing of the angle. Um, and so that would be... Um, and, uh, and the pressure was sort of slowly creeping up. And so uh, he showed me some amazing pictures and uh, I'm glad that I haven't had to do it so far. <laughs> yeah. Maybe oh. with the family history? I mean, suppose the mother had it and then the baby was brought in for screening yeah. or something. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe that would be one possibly. Right. Yeah. Dr. Sushmita, shall I move on to the next question? Yes, please. Uh, please. I was uh, just thinking about sturge Weber syndrome. So, um, you know, these eyes are prone to choroidal effusions and suprachoroidal hemorrhages, and there sometimes is a large choroidal hemangioma in the fundus. So, what would be your uh, surgery of choice in uh, children with Sturge Weber syndrome and glaucoma? So, so, how do you um, deal with these eyes in particular? Yeah, so Sturge Weber actually uh, comes in a bimodal glaucoma presentation. And if they come in infancy, we've seen many, many babies with Sturge Weber and glaucoma, then it's usually because of an angle dysgenesis. And uh, many times the other eye also has one. So there the, the uh, surgical approaches and everything would be similar to any, any uh, angle dysgenesis. And I would prefer a goniotomy because it's closed chamber uh, rather than opening up the eye. However, the other uh, uh, spectrum would be a young adult. And those are the ones which are terrible. Those are the ones, if you have a 14, 15 year old girl with Sturge Weber and you're going to operate her, you're going to land up in trouble. So what we have seen in the past, we've taken a leaf out of the port wine stain and infantile hemangiomas treatment. And we started giving propranolol two milligram per kg in two divided doses a week prior and then continue for about six weeks after. And I shouldn't be saying that, but touch wood, after that, our incidences of effusions have come down drastically. And I think they might be involuting it a little bit and you just need it in the periocular period when you have lowered the pressure and it's a leaky choroid which will effuse. So that's worked for me. We've, we've published that in ophthalmology glaucoma and a lot of our colleagues do that now and they're very happy. What so, about radiation therapy to reduce the size of the margin? We've Not never, done any we've longer? Never, never done that. No, we haven't done that. Thank you, Yeah, that's why I can like to ask some comments. On, on Aniridia. So, Aniridia, oh, okay. one of my uh, good friend and colleague, Dr. George, you know, he's recently uh, had a good work in AJO where he compares trabeculectomy. It's not a randomized trial, but it's just okay. an experience between trabeculectomy with mitomycin and our oral lab approach drainage implant. Okay. And they found excellent results with RD over TRAP. In the failure rates, it was much higher at TRAP group than the RD group. And the complications were similar between both the groups. And more importantly, cataract extraction was 
was done more often for the trabeculectomy group. You know, you know the mitomycin, the cataract progresses. So they all let, land up in a cataract surgery and complications related to cataract surgery and again long-term effects of cataract over the pleb but also uh, on the angle. So so that is one thing which really you know, says that even you have an iniridia, go for a primary GDD than doing a trabeculectomy and then saving the eye for a GDD. Okay. Uh, let's talk about FAK glaucoma then, Kitesh. So, how do you deal with these eyes? Because, you know, this bleb, uh, especially, you know, if the child is going to use the contact lenses, uh, lebitis, and so many other things are a cause of concern in FAK glaucoma. So, what is your uh, approach in uh, children with FAK glaucoma? It's, it's definitely challenging. Anybody with cataract surgery, you know, I mean, the risk for developing glaucoma is almost 100%. That's what we say over the next uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. So anybody would develop glaucoma. So you might have to closely follow these patients. And once they are affected with glaucoma, definitely I think all these roles for contact lens and all that is very tricky in some of these eyes when you have touched those eyes already. If they are not touched, okay, you can, if you're managing on anti glaucoma medications, all that is possible. But once you have touched those eyes, so then you need to be really very careful. Maybe you have to advise them to use glasses for a long term. Uh, even secondary eye wall implantation is very risky. We have a lot of good techniques to do. But again, if you're going to again manipulate the eye, the conjunctiva, the sclera to insert the iris, uh, whatever the technique you do, again, the risk for the failure for retrobectelectomy or whatever procedure you have done is very high. So these are very tricky eyes. We need repeated examinations or also close uh, follow-up. Okay. Before we go on to discussing the surgical management in a little more detail, part uh, we'll talk about the medical management, uh, which is one drug uh, which you would not use in a child. Uh, this is just generally for all general ophthalmologists. And uh, in poor prostaglandin analogs, which would you, would you prefer to use in a child? Is it like anoprost or uh, bimetoprost? A little bit of detail on that as well. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so one medication that I definitely wouldn't use in a child is brimonidine, which um, is marketed in Australia as alphagan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that has been found um, in multiple cases in series to result in respiratory and central nervous system depression. So I would avoid that certainly in any child uh, under seven years of age, if possible. Um, sometimes, um, the uh, le, le, uh, related drug iopidine or aproclonidine um, can be used, um, but I tend to avoid that as well. Um, so I avoid bromonidine in particular, as well as aproclonidine. Um, in terms of the uh, um, latanoprost versus dematoprost, I tend to start off with, um, I don't know if there's any um, specific difference between the two in terms of efficacy, but I tend to start with latanoprost um, just because it's more easily available here um, for the children. Yeah. You want to add anything, Dr. Venkatesh and Dr. Sushmita? I think we agree with what Pat says. The one thing which you don't use is remonitor. It causes CNS depression and we don't know it reacts in these young children. Phycotic uh, is the second option after Timolol, which is very safe. Uh, but again, you know, uh, nothing safer than a Timolol unless there is a contraindication for Timolol. Okay, we tend to use uh, uh, brinzolamide more often than Timolol sometimes because, especially yeah. in small children, though we do instruct the mothers to, you know, occlude the puncta and all that, but then I, I'm a little safer with the brinzolamide than the timolol going in and causing uh, bradycardia or something. So, yeah, yes. yeah. Respiratory issues. Yes. Yes. Okay, um, Dr. Sushmita, we'll start off with goniotomy. So, okay. uh, it's a very logical kind of procedure. You see an angle then, but it's technically definitely challenging and difficult. So, um, how, how many uh, quadrants would you do? Is it just one quadrant? And if there is, what is the failure rate or relapse rate with a goniotomy? And when there is a relapse, would you go back and do on the same quadrant or you select another quadrant for goniotomy? Can you just elaborate on this? Yeah, so we try to uh, do as much as we can. Okay. So like, like uh, I had said that, that uh, either you have your assistant who can, you know, rotate your eye 
and you can manage a little more than 180 as well but 180 you do manage mm -hmm. with the goniotomy assisted uh, uh, transluminal trabeculotomy or gat mm -hmm. with the proline um, many times i can manage 360 which is very good mm -hmm. but even if i can't if i manage a hemi as i said just one side but you still have about another quadrant left so 270 is easily done mm -hmm. so um, it's a matter of getting a little used to maybe even in the adults if you can just get used to uh, turning the microscope turning the head um, it's it's okay. So what I mean, kind of uh, lenses do you use? Use the Swan Jacob? Yes, I use the Swan Jacob. Okay. I use the Swan Jacob. I found that the most uh, the easiest. And we go around to the sterility bit by using any gonioscope for the diagnostic pros, uh, part before the EUA by just an alcohol wipe or something. And because there you don't need to tilt the microscope or anything, you just use the microscope as though it was a slit lamp. And you can do your diagnostic gonioscopy and then use the sterile one for your surgery. So that's the usual procedure. Um, regarding the second one, yes, I'm somehow a little partial towards doing the other side. It's a little trickier going nasally. But uh, if I haven't done a 360 or something, I would go in and try the second. And I think the second goniotomies do work as well. But after that is when I, I mean, as a glaucoma surgeon. What is the relapse so, rate, Dr. Sushmita? So they have a good prognosis, goniotomy, I think, has a good success rate. So yeah, so like, um, um, I, I'm quoting Dr. Arif Khan, who said that you can't put PCG into one basket. So if you give me a garden PCG, infantile onset, mild corneal haze, anything will work. Goniotomy will work, trabeculotomy will work, a combined trap will work, a tube will work. So okay. you can't tell me one over the other. <laughs> but if you have a, if I have a child which is less than a month old, I'm on my guard. I would know that neonatal onset glaucoma is a little different ball game. And if you have a child which is more than two or three years old, that's another area where it probably won't work. So if I do it only, so my, my results will be about 90% if I do it between, say, two months to, say, two years old. Mm -hmm. But if I include the neonatal onset and the plus three years, it'll probably drop down to about 70%. But we've learned this over time. Mm -hmm. And now I tend to probably in a, a neonatal onset glaucoma usually come with very, very bad corneas where you can't do a goniotomy anyway, at least in our setting. So we'll end up doing a combined trap with trap. So if in a goniotomy, an infantile onset PCG, the goniotomy rates are as high as 85 to 90% as well. And these are one or two goniotomies. So they're very, very good. And if you don't have to open conjunctive as a glaucoma surgeon, it's the best thing. If you don't have to touch it. Excellent. You're keeping the conjunctiva for another surgery later. Hopefully, okay. just keeping the conjunctiva away. <laughs> I don't okay. want to touch it. <laughs> okay. All, all it problems in glaucoma is because of conjunctiva, I think. Dr. Venkatesh, about trabeculotomy, I, I'm sure like most of you must be doing trap with trap, especially in Indian eyes. But just uh, trabeculotomy per se when you do it. Now, how do you actually, Dr. Park was uh, telling that nice thing where uh, the white meets the uh, blue, the Schlems waits for you. So, any other tips as to how abs extend or you locate the Schlems canal? Yeah, yeah, the most important tip which Park again beautifully showed is zooming up there. You need to really zoom up. A lot of people don't do that. You do with the same magnification like how you okay. do a cataract surgery, all steps. Glaucoma surgery doesn't work, especially for makes and procedures like this. Zooming up is really very, very important so that you really see that area, you know, where that color change happens. And of course, the architecture also changes, which you can appreciate between the wavy pattern and the other pattern. The architectural change also gives you an idea uh, in addition to the color change. So zooming up and doing that uh, knife uh, function, I mean, slowly you make a incision to gradually enter into the slums canal. So that is, that is very, very important step. So you uh, see the aqueous coming out, the first yeah. drop of aqueous. You just wait for the aqueous to come out and then uh, you use your right trabeculot, the right side, left side. Now you have to be very careful in uh, taking it because little anxious you are you know, mm. on the you know, way, your assistants. You'll have to be very sure which side you're going to do. Make sure they give that side to you in your other hand so that you can finish it off quickly. Dr. Sushmita, any tips to locate? You, you can offer any other tips? 
apart from what one of the part if you, and, uh, yeah if you notice what this is what we've learned a little bit of a perforating vessel that's mm -hmm. usually the area where the schlems would be and the other thing is when you zoom up as dr venkatesh so rightly said you know the the curve of the sclera and the curve of the cornea is different so okay. there's a little bit of a dip there and if <laughs> under magnification you just see where that change in curvature is you have a fair idea that that's where it is but um these are all theory <laughs> you okay. go into the OR and then, <laughs> then learn by, all of us have learned <laughs> by ourselves <laughs> somehow but these are tips we and watch lots and lots of videos there's so many of them available because the eyes are going to be different every baby is going to be different so, so there's a brilliant uh, ACRS award-winning movie by uh, Dr. Reshmi and Sirisha. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Here, uh, no, on the yes. three books which we were just talking about in mm -hmm. the Yeah. Okay, excellent. Dr. Park, do you use that illuminated micro catheter to do the trebuchlotomy? Uh, yeah, I haven't had access to that, unfortunately. It's not available here in um, Australia. I, I was just interested in knowing yeah. what happens when you encounter an obstruction and you try doing this 360 degrees trepoclotomy. Dr. Sushmita, would you like to um, oh, take all of that? I, I haven't had access to that. Tanuj has been lucky. He has friends abroad who gifts him the microcatheter. I haven't ever uh, done that, but I've tried the GAT. And oh. with that, when I encounter an obstruction, I must uh, confess yes. that I there was just once that I forced my way through and I had an iridodialysis and I learned my lesson. So no, I, I, I just saw literature about subretinal migration of this polyprotein yes. in future. Yes, yes, so that's it's quite why dangerous it's, and scary. Yeah, so it's, it's scary. And that was when it was 360 ab external. So, okay. so uh, when I had the iridodialysis, I knew I need to stop. So if I if I get an obstruction, yeah, that's I one just reason why some of these techniques don't get popular, you know, because there are few surgeons who can do it perfectly because they okay. are want to do these procedures. You know? okay. Even NPDS became like, NPDS gives excellent results, but still there are very few surgeons across the globe who do. Some in Germany, mm -hmm. some in South Africa, some in Australia, very few in India. So over the years, you have to see how your skill is to do some yeah. of these techniques and then take a call. That's what I've seen in at least my 10, 15 years of following some of these procedures. They are really skillful procedures and uh, it's not that they have mastered it to make it very easy like FACO mm -hmm. or some other techniques. So unless we do like this, some of these procedures will be challenging. Venkatesh, we'll go on to trabeclectomy. Uh, what would be your um, uh, take on uh, the, you know, uh, trabeclectomy in a child? Because we want to ensure a posterior flow. We do not want a subconjunctival scarring to take place so that the blood lasts for a, a longer time. So, what is your take on the Moon Fields Safer Surgery System? What tips or uh, uh, steps would you advocate for the bleb in a child to last for a longer time? So, how would you fashion yeah, your what what the safe technique describes? I would even do for somebody, you know, uh, like a child or uh, even a juvenile open angle glaucoma. But yeah. one thing, instead of mitomycin in some of the juvenile open angle glaucomas, I prefer the ologen, you know, the uh, collagen matrix, which is uh, having a much, much better results and also a safer option. So that is one thing which I, I prefer, especially if they are myopes and if they have thinner skin as uh, ologen over mitomycin. The rest of the steps are as, you know, uh, as good as how we all try to do the safe system. You want a more posterior flow, so you, you, you try to do a lot of posterior dissection and make sure your cut end doesn't go up to the limbus so that it doesn't leak in the sides. I, I try to do a slightly bigger flap and uh, make an adequate closure and then do a close follow-up of these patients so that I can release those sutures or lyse it or depending on the need, take them to the OR and remove it. Uh, so as, as any glaucoma surgeon here also, now we don't want the chamber to shallow, but some of these eyes do very well than some even adult eyes, I would say. The chamber may not form in the uh, uh, even on the table, but sometimes they are uh, so very well formed. Uh, the following is so elastic to form the chamber if you have difficulty in forming the chamber not actually you can you can you can leave it you can most chambers form even if it doesn't form very well you can leave it dr sushmita would you like to add any points uh, i am a little more like to be a small child yeah i'm a little Except more liberal. any special pearls would you like to add on uh, we just need to be a little more careful with the scleral flap 
especially okay. doing it with small children because it, it's elastic and before you know it, it can macerate. And I'm a little more liberal with leaving a little bit of viscoelastic. I somehow am more comfortable leaving a chamber form because these babies may not show you anything next morning. So it's very difficult for me to, and I don't want to prize open their lids to examine them. So I'm a little more liberal with leaving viscoelastic. And that's about it. I mean, I don't Mitomycin C, you are applying, like, what is your strength of mitomycin C and how long do you apply? Same, as the, same as the adults, 0.2 okay. milligram for two minutes. What about you, Dr. Venkatesh? Same, same. same. Okay, Dr. Path, any differences or is it the same? Um, I think similar. I think um, in in the States, we used to apply 0.4 for African-Americans um, and or if the child was under one. Um, so just a slightly higher dose um, because they tended to um, get more scarring reaction um, post-operatively, but otherwise 0.2. What is your take on fire food, Dr. Sushmita and Dr. Venkatesh? intra pre-op, both. No, I don't okay. use 5 if you intra op and post operatively, post -op. very, very rarely. No, I don't use that in children. Venkatesh, what about you? Usually adults, but not in children. No, post operatively for the failure, we do 5 few injection, but we are not using routinely in children. Okay. The next thing is on glaucoma drainage devices. Sushmita, you have a great, uh, valuable experience on using the drainage devices. So what do you use? Do you use the RD as uh, told by Dr. Venkatesh and your tips for placement of the drainage devices? What are your tips? Um, yes, I, I prefer the non-valve. In India, we don't get the bar valve, but yes, the RD. And uh, um, our incidence of very high encapsulated blebs has fallen drastically from what we used to see with the AGV. So my preferred choice Cost no bar is the is the adi now with children, and uh, the placement is uh, below the recti muscles. It's a very flexible plate, and we usually don't have any problems with that. I mean, as as usual, the and by the time the children require an adi, actually their eyes are almost as big as an adult eye anyway. So there's not much different that we do as we would do in an adult. The only thing to take care of is that the children do rub. So the tubes must not be too long. And if it's put in a smaller baby, in a growing eye, remember the it's, it's a little unpredictable. Sometimes the tube can go in towards the pupil and sometimes the tube can go out. So depending on where the plate is and how the eyeball grows, it can go either way. So we need to keep a watch on, on that. What about corneal complications with these drainage devices in children? Because they are in for a long period of time, corneal melt or, you know, corneal decompensation. Yes. So, so as the hairs grow grayer, your incidence of drainage devices in small children goes less and less because you've seen them come back. And yes, that is a choice. That is a problem. So frankly, if you give me a choice and it's an eye which is not seen too well anyway, I would probably prefer a, a cyclodiode with transillumination rather than, you know, put in a, a valve device. But these are things that you have to take care of. More EUAs, the slightest bit you have to tell the parents come back, a little bit of redness or watering or anything, you have to come right back and you have to take care of them. That's a risk. Like, uh, especially in uh, glaucomas following eye syndromes, you know, where. Yes. Yes, a lot of sinecase and all that. That's Correct. where it's very tricky. So some of these yes. uh, can go through anterior to your endothelium and uh, result in this problem. So that's one place where you know the where people even try to do a little bit of iridectomy in that place and place it right over yes. the legs. Now even if that area becomes little cataract, you no, know, it doesn't progress, but uh, it stays there like a localized opacity. But definitely away from the endothelium is very important in some of these eyes, especially if they have a shallow chambers and iris abdominis. So would you like to put it in the posterior chamber if there is, it's a pseudophagic patient? I think that would be the best. Definitely, definitely in the sulcus mm -hmm. or wherever it's possible, wherever possible. Sushmita, what about the past plan approach? Have you tried that? 
your experience so, on that? Uh, the pass planar approach requires a meticulous vitrectomy at the at the skirt, and uh, normally the vitrectomized eyes does, do not necessarily have a good skirt vitrectomy. And if your tube is right there, it's going to get blocked. So I I haven't had a very good experience with pass planar. I would rather than put it into the pass planar, I'd rather put it into the sulcus if it's uh, pseudo phakic or aphakic. Or as Dr. Venkatesh said, just make a tiny peephole and place it over the zonules, so that I can see it. But it's it's far away from. But is no, it, do you place it even with the lens, clear lens in situ? This yes. Way? Yes. Okay. Yes, you make a small, small, tiny peep hole in the iris, and okay. you can place it just there on the zonules, so that it doesn't touch the lens. Okay. But you can see it postoperatively. Okay, that's great. Just, just over the oh. lens, nothing happens. For the lens. We've seen a lot of cases so because you need to see what's happening there. Also. Yeah. So that's where that iridectomy really helps. Venkatesh, I would like to ask your take on, you know, RD versus, you know, a bar weld or something. There must be literature studies and, you know, you people yourself might have done a few studies at Arvind Eye Care System. No, so, no, we didn't, we didn't want to bar, bar, bother bar weld very well because he helped us to develop the RD. So, we didn't cannot do a, a, a right-on trial to compare these two. But uh, but definitely, you know, we have several publications now from Dr. George and Dr. Sushmita and Dr. Sirisha and, Seven okay. other institutes uh, across the developing world. So how does it fare? It's almost we're, we're equal or better? Fair, extremely good. No, we, we won't say better, okay. not inferior. I would say not inferior, and mm -hmm. it's more pliable. That's what people who have used both. Because I have not used parallel, but okay. the, the people who have used Adi said it's more pliable. It's very easy to insert under the muscle than even a parallel. That's what uh, some of the experts, especially people in UK. Uh, Keith Barton and others who have been using extensively both barrel and when they go to Africa, they use RD. So they said this is much easier to use. Excellent, excellent. And the last question is to Dr. Park. But Dr. Park, can you elucidate what are the factors uh, which uh, determine the visual prognosis in a child with glaucoma? So we'll round up with this. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, several factors. Um, and I think the first and foremost would really be um, the status of the cornea. And unfortunately, I see patients who develop a uh, Harb's tree right across the center of the cornea. And um, based on that, the sort of central vision is really affected. But, you know, controlling the pressure, um, getting on top of um, the control of the glaucoma is paramount. Um, and then uh, visual prognosis, so an isometropic amblyopia is important. Um, often these children may be um, in, in glasses or, or um, if possible in contact lenses to uh, correct the anisometropia, patching as much as possible. Um, and then the complications of surgery, so, you know, cataract and um, some of them become aphakic or pseudophakic. Uh, so I think all of those factors, if, if, if I mean, there's been a couple of children who have done well from the glaucoma point of view and then gone on to have endothelial transplantation. Um, and that's done well to clear their cornea, especially with the central heart tree. Um, but um, I think um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a number of factors and um, it's not just one thing. So I think these are the children, as I mentioned, we, we see in the clinic very often um, and we sort of get to know them and their parents very well. Um, they really need the gamut of um everything that we do so refractive correction uh, medical management surgical management dr sushpita and dr venkatesh your last words on it um sadly a major component also uh, seems to be amblyopia okay. because uh, people uh, i don't know why we seem to forget that uh, they are not just small adults and you don't need to just look at pressures and discs and all that and progression, but you need to look at refractive errors, especially in the unilateral ones and amblyopia. So if my take home would be, it would be a meticulous refraction at least two or three times a year, change of glasses because their glasses get very scratched. So what we think is a refractive error, okay, but if you just hold up their glass, it's fallen so many times that they can hardly see anything through it. And uh, of course, rebismus, the other thing, you know, a lot of them might have, might go here and there and you don't even realize that. So I think visual assessment and amblyopia treatment, that would be my take. Dr. Venkatesh, your words? 
Yeah, just to end, I'll just add on to whatever they said. Is is more engagement with the parents here because they are like special parents here. You no, know, once the baby is born with congenital glaucoma, they may have to take them, you know, across, throughout their life or even till they will take care of their own selves. So I engage with the parents, not at the very first sitting, but at least uh, after the UA or after the surgery, I sit and talk with them, you know, make them understand how important all these things are over the years. So so initially, then be very difficult to digest it, but over the years they understand. And then they come back and you see a lot of times very rewarding uh, kids coming back to your clinic you know and even you see them uh, getting graduated or clearing in uh, uh, very good marks and things like that which make you very happy at the end of the day that was very nice it was a really engaging uh, discussion with all three of you i really had a great time thanks a lot for being here today dr park dr sushmita Dr. Venkatesh for making time and being with us for this grand rounds. So we are on the threshold of a festive evening. So tomorrow is Tamil New Year's Day. And on this happy note, I'm wishing all the viewers a very happy uh, Tamil New Year's Day tomorrow. And with this, we are signing off uh, with this grand rounds tonight. Thank you. And good. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.